Thank you. The next item of business is a statement by Richard Lockhead on supporting further and higher education. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Richard Lender. Minister, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In the midst of this global health crisis, I want to start by paying tribute to our world-leading universities and colleges in Scotland. The pandemic has placed unprecedented demands on the sector, yet the response of our colleges and universities has, as I'm sure we'll all agree, been quite remarkable, given how quickly they've had to adapt to a new set of very challenging circumstances they could never, ever have imagined. But they have risen to the challenges, and we thank them for it. I also want to put on record the significant work underway in the community learning and development sector to support some of Scotland's most vulnerable adults and young people as well. That sector continues to deliver essential support despite, again, the challenges of COVID-19. And I want all of the people working in that sector to know that their efforts have very much been recognised and are very much appreciated by the Scottish Government and indeed this Parliament. Mm -hmm. Deputy President Officer, we know the pandemic is an unprecedented external shock. It requires government and institutions to work very closely together. And that's why I set up a leadership group as early as March when the impact first began to emerge. And that group brings together senior leaders across post-16 education, from principals to union leaders to student representatives, where we could get around a virtual table on a regular basis to discuss how best to respond to this significant crisis. And it's overseeing our work on a wide range of issues, including financial sustainability and digital poverty. And I'd like to thank all the members of the group for their tireless efforts. The fact remains that COVID-19 is having a massive impact on our further and higher education sectors. On international student mobility, to a drop in commercial income and in charitable and industry related uh, research income and other factors that all combined pose potentially a huge challenge to the sector, albeit we don't know and won't know for some time the full extent of that challenge. Of course, it's not just a Scottish or UK problem, this is a global problem. And today I've published a summary of our immediate support for our institutions and how we are looking towards what may be needed in the future as well. And our Further and Higher Education Sustainability Plan includes additional resources. We have now provided the £75 million to protect world-leading research in our institutions, £10 million for estates development, development of an international student action plan, additional £5 million across further higher education for student support, and early access to £11.4 million of HE hardship funds as well. And importantly, our universities will also have access to grants and substantial long-term low-interest loans that the UK government announced on the 27th of June related to research. And I think it's really important that we are clear about one critical point, and that is that our colleges and universities absolutely deserve the utmost support because they are vital to the solution that Scotland needs to get through and out of this crisis. A fact indeed that was recognised in the recently published Benny Higgins report towards the robust resilient wellbeing economy for Scotland. And that's one key reason why I asked the Scottish Funding Council to lead a review of the provision of financial sustainability to ensure they're able to play that role. Its work will shape an important part of the government's thinking on future strategy for tertiary education in Scotland. Institutional health is one aspect of the plan, but support for students is another as well. And online learning in particular has arrived with a bang for much of the sector. And so have some of the subsequent challenges from that, such as some learners being unable to enjoy the full benefits of connectivity. On digital support, the Scottish Government has already invested over £40 million in supporting um, access to digital technology. And today I can announce that we will go further and invest an additional £5 million to help bridge the digital divide for students in Scotland as well. This will see investment in adaptive technologies for students with disabilities, increased online support, and for the most disadvantaged, provide the devices that they need to have access to for their learning. And I am pleased to say that our colleges and our universities will be open for business after the summer. Students from Scotland and the rest of the UK and overseas can be absolutely confident of receiving the benefits of an excellent Scottish education. And as the First Minister said in her message to international students just a few days ago, our prime focus will also be on their safety. 
from Monday the 13th of July, time-sensitive mandatory or regulated skills assessments that are essential to the completion of modern apprenticeship qualifications or to comply with a legal obligation can resume in their colleges. And from the 22nd of July, colleges and universities can begin a phased return to on-campus learning as part of a blended model with remote teaching. And appropriate safety measures, including physical distancing, will of course be in place. Two metres physical distancing remains the default, and institutions should continue to plan for the new term on that basis. However, as we've entered phase three of the route map and move forward, exemptions will be considered for specific sectors and settings where agreed additional mitigations must be put in place. That would allow organisations in these relevant sectors, if they choose to operate with a one metre distance in condition that agreed mitigations, fully recorded risk assessments are implemented. And we are now looking at whether such exemptions may be applied to colleges and universities in certain circumstances. We will provide an update on this work as soon as we can. Our approach throughout this crisis has been to ensure the continued safety of staff and students, and I want to be clear that that remains our absolute priority. I know that for prospective and continuing students, this has been a worrying and uncertain time. But our institutions remain world-class, welcoming and open, and with the measures set out in our guidance, will remain safe. And today's new UCAS figures showing a 16% increase in the number of non-EU applications to our universities, the highest in the UK, is an encouraging sign that that message is hopefully now getting through. But as if the monumental COVID-19 uh, challenge wasn't enough, the challenge of Brexit is also about to become very real as well. COVID coincides with Brexit, presenting a double whammy for our universities and our colleges. And let me remind the Chamber, this is a UK government that turned its back on Europe, not Scotland. But now that chaotic handling of the entire Brexit process jeopardises the future success of our colleges and universities and our students and our young people. These institutions, our students and young people, and our research excellence have all disproportionately benefited from EU membership compared to the UK counterparts and will now be disproportionately harmed. The Scottish Government has always been clear that its overwhelming priority is for Scotland to remain a part of Erasmus Plus and Horizon 2020 for their unparalleled education, cultural and economic benefits. Scotland gains a huge amount from these programmes and we secure proportionately more funding under both than any other part of the UK. We were told by the UK Government that we would be co-creators in building the UK's future relationship with international mobility. Instead, no one will be surprised in the Chamber to hear that negotiations have been quite frustrating and the tendency to consult us on decisions after they are taken continues, such as the recent decision that any UK alternative to Erasmus would not subsidise inward mobility. We will continue to be open and constructive, but the clock is ticking and I am afraid the signals on Erasmus point towards a poor outcome for young Scots compared to the advantages that previous generations enjoyed. Equally, there's no good Brexit for university research, and we're also still not any clearer about the future of Horizon 2020. And remember, the Audit Scotland warned of a Brexit cost of £211 million to our universities. I will keep Parliament up to date with any progress in these areas. Even though the full impact of Brexit is yet to be seen, I must now set out its effect on EU tuition fees. As a result of EU law, since the government abolished tuition fees, we have treated EU students in the same way we treat students from Scotland. They don't pay tuition fees. It's only as a result of EU law applying in Scotland that this was possible, indeed it was mandatory. Our EU law obligations cease at the end of the transition period in a few months, and continuing with this arrangement for 21-22, we significantly increase the risk of any legal challenge. So following the UK's vote to leave the EU, I have previously announced that the 2021 academic year was a transition year for the policy, and therefore it's with a heavy heart that we have taken a difficult decision to end free education for new EU students from the academic year 2021-2022 onwards as a direct consequence of Brexit. EU students who have already started their studies or who start this autumn will not be affected and will still be tuition free for the entirety of their courses. This change is a stark reality of Brexit and a painful reminder that our country's decisions are affected by UK policies that we did not support and we didn't vote for. But our internationalism remains a key strength of higher education in Scotland. 
So we will discuss with the sector an ambitious scholarship programme to ensure the ancient European nation of Scotland continues to attract significant numbers of European students to study here. And as a consequence of the decision we have taken on EU students, we must also decide what happens to the funding that currently supports these places. And I can confirm that we will not remove the funding we currently devote to pay, paying EU student fees from the overall funding for the sector. And in current trends and following further analysis, we estimate this could be up to £19 million for 21-22 alone. And as a result of that decision, this new flexibility for the sector should lead to an increase in the number of students from Scotland getting a place at university. At a time when our young people face the economic impact of COVID-19, and that means no doubt this will provide some significant support at an important time. So in conclusion, as we respond to COVID-19, as we respond to Brexit, I want to emphasise to the Chamber that the continued success of our colleges and universities is crucial. It's crucial to our economic prosperity, it's crucial to our future social well-being, and it must be central to the recovery of this country that we now must build. Our colleges and universities provide our people with life chances and skills and are the engines that power our society. They are a source of strength for our nation, and we must protect them. And this government will stand by them to meet the challenges and grasp the exciting opportunities that lie ahead. And I hope Parliament will support us as we do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. We've got about 20 minutes for questions, after which uh, we will conclude. And it would be helpful if members wish to ask a question to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Jamie Green to be followed by Ian Gray. Mr Green, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement today? And can I also pay tribute to those in our colleges and universities, especially the staff who have uh, been faced with unprecedented challenges in these past few difficult months. And like others, I too welcome those who come to Scotland to study. They enrich our campuses and our universities. But equally, we have a duty to deliver fairness for Scottish students. The cessation of the government's policy to offer free university education to EU students in Scotland must come with an upside to Scottish students. Now that there is no longer an obligation to do so, it is only right that those funds must be used to support instead Scottish students in Scottish universities. To do that, the Scottish Government can start uh, by lifting the unfair cap on Scottish domiciled students, which we know denies some 15,000 Scots a place at a university every year in this country. It is a reality and an appalling one at that, presiding officer, that Scottish students with as many as eight A grades and their hires are rejected from universities such are the current funding structures. This surely cannot be allowed to continue. And the truth is that today's announcement barely scratches the surface of the deep cutting financial problems that our sector faces. Way before COVID crisis, the sector faced an estimated black hole of around half a billion pounds. And the stark reality is, presiding officer, is that this sector has faced dire financial outcomes for many years under its current structures. Everybody knows that, and today's announcement Please will not get to your question that. now, Mr Green. So let me ask specifically then, let me ask the Minister, whether the £97 million that we currently spend on fund, funding EU undergraduates will stay in the higher education sector in its entirety and in what capacity? How specifically those savings will go towards lifting that cap on university places for Scottish students? And if so, how many places does he think it will free up? And, and you must conclude now. You went well over your time. I'm, I'm given, sorry. But given the, I said given you those... must conclude. Please sit down, Minister. I thank Jamie Green for his opening comments. And can I say that I think he paints a very inaccurate picture of what's happening for the edu higher education at the current time. Over the last couple of years, we've seen record numbers of Scottish students attending Scottish universities. We've seen a growing economic contribution from our universities and higher education to this country as well. It's in a very healthy state. Now we do face the twin challenges of COVID-19 and Brexit, yet it's Jamie Green's party that's foisting Brexit onto the sector that's delivering the only threat uh, it's faced before COVID at the current uh, time as well. We've also seen today, in terms of the new UCAS figures, there's an overall 3% increase in the number of applications to Scottish universities. And as I said in my opening remarks, that includes a 16% increase in non-EU overseas students applying to Scottish universities as well. So that tells me that our sector is performing wonderfully well 
uh, selling its message to the rest of the world really well at the current time in terms of coming here for quality education in a safe environment, and I congratulate them for that. And as I said in my opening remarks to answer Jamie's key point, the money that is currently devoted towards EU students as part of the budget will be remaining within the higher education budget. And therefore, at this time, when young people will be looking for options given the potential significant economic downturn, that's good news for the number of Scottish students attending our universities. Thank you. Ian Gray, followed by Claire Adams. <clears throat> Thank you, President Officer, and thanks to the Minister for uh, early sight of his statement. Uh, I certainly agree with him that our tertiary education sector uh, will be critical to rebuilding a modern, high-skilled economy driven by research and innovation, and so uh, our universities and colleges must be protected. Yet, prior to the pandemic, they already faced an uncertain financial future. Audit Scotland repeatedly warned us about the financial fragility of colleges, while university funding had been cut by over 11% in recent years. Those UCAS figures that applications are holding up are welcome, but universities still fear that many of those international students will not in fact arrive in September with serious financial consequences. So does the First Minister have a contingency plan for our universities or is he just crossing our fingers that these students will in fact appear? Secondly, there is no additional financial support here for colleges. Will he at least guarantee the FE settlement in the 2021 budget, even if outcomes are disrupted in that sector? And finally, colleges and universities are planning now for their new terms activities in September. If pubs, restaurants and public transport can be told now to plan for one metre social distancing, why can't colleges and universities? Minister, please. Uh, I thank Ian Gray for, for his comments. Can I just say at the outset that our universities and our colleges are national assets and we should be very proud of them. And we have seen an increasing number of students recently. We have seen an increasing number of international students recently. We're seeing uh, research success after research success. So we should not be painting pictures of doom and gloom. Yes, there are financial challenges. And now with the twin challenges of COVID-19 and Brexit, I have asked the Scottish Funding Council to look at many of the points that Ian Gray legitimately raises about the future finances of the sector and how it's funded and how the funding is used within the sectors to make sure that we are fleet of foot and agile as a country because there's lots of international competitors out there doing really good things and we can't stand still and I absolutely accept that. So that's why we have commissioned the Scottish Funding Council. In terms of resources, um, many of the uh, uh, budgets I, I, I mentioned in my opening remarks do apply to colleges that are further and higher education. And higher education is delivered by colleges as well as by universities. So they do benefit uh, colleges to a significant degree, albeit £75 million for researchers universities, and accept that. If we devote more money to college and universities, uh, Ian Gray has to tell us where that money comes out of. Because as um, Kate Forbes has said in a previous statement, we're limited in terms of how we can borrow. Therefore, we rely on consequentials from the UK government. We've not yet had those consequentials to help us give further support to our college and universities. So I urge all members, small parties, to put pressure on the UK government as well to allow us to do more to help our universities and colleges. Thank you. Of 11 members with questions, I'd like short questions and short answers, if possible, please. Claire Adamson, followed by Jamie Halco Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Minister, uh, in my constituency of Motherwell Militia, many of my constituents benefit from the widening and access agendas of the universities. Um, COVID has compounded the problems that um, some of these students have in terms of retention and the fact that they weren't able to claim universal credit over the summer and that jobs are limited, financial strains are there, as well as general societal problems uh, like mental health issues that will be affecting many, many at this time. So I would just like to ask what conversations you've had with colleges and universities to ensure that one of the unintended consequences here is a widening social inequality. Minister. Uh, thank you, Claire Adamson uh, raises a very important point. And the Deputy First Minister and myself have been discussing regularly what more we can do in the times ahead to support people who will be getting the brunt of the impact of the COVID-19 crisis in Scotland and could be even further away from education as a result of that. And that's why the community learning development uh, sector has a big role to play, as well as our colleges and indeed our universities. Um, at the recent meeting of the leadership group, which I mentioned before, we had the Commissioner for Wedding Access 
um, speaking to us and giving us some advice of what we can do to make sure there's not too much of a detrimental impact on widening access in this economic crisis uh, that we're potentially facing. So I just want to assure Claire, that we, uh, Claire Adamson that we are giving due attention to the issues around student hardship and indeed uh, the, the impact of the economic crisis on those being further away from education. Jamie Halford Johnson, followed by Keith Brown. I know that both further and higher education institutions stand ready to assist in skill support, vital, as the Minister said, in emerging from the coronavirus outbreak. The First Minister welcomed the proposal from the Higgins Report for Jobs Guarantee Scheme. So can he clarify whether he envisages that education through both colleges and universities will form some part of that scheme, and can he outline what part they could play? Thank you, Minister. It's a very good question from Jamie Halco Johnson. And yes, there's no doubt our colleges in particular have a big role to play in taking forward some of these policies. But the details you can imagine is being worked out in the coming weeks. Uh, and we are having regular discussions with both the Scottish Funding Council uh, and the further higher education sectors about the role they'll potentially play in making sure that Scotland has the skills pipeline for the post-COVID-19 economy. And that is really, really important. And clearly that's wrapped, wrapped up in all the issues around apprenticeships uh, and so on. So that is a very important debate and I'll keep Parliament updated. Keith Brown, followed by Daniel Johnson. Uh, as an alumnus of the University of Stirling, the Minister will know, uh, it's based in my constituency, that it has a reputation for both world-class research and teaching, and it's very attractive to international students. And I know the University has been working hard to ensure it's ready for the coming academic year and to once again welcome students from the, around the world. And I note what the Minister says about the increased numbers of applications from overseas, which is welcome. But can the Minister confirm what the Scottish Government is doing to support Stirling University and universities across Scotland to reassure international students that they represent a safe environment to undertake their studies in. Minister. Uh, I thank Keith Brown uh, for his question and for mentioning the University of Stirling, which I've got a soft spot for, for the reasons he cited, as have others uh, in the chamber. Uh, I'd also like to take the opportunity of congratulating Jerry McCormick, the principal of the University of Stirling, who's now taken over as the chair of University of Scotland. Therefore, my interaction with the University of Stirling is probably about to be heightened intensively over the coming weeks and months. Uh, but I can assure uh, Keith Brown that uh, the University of Stirling and all Scotland's universities are represented in a leadership group. They've been making their, making their views extremely well known about the way forward for the whole sector and for Scotland. And I'm sure the University of Stirling uh, will benefit from any of the measures we're implementing just as they will across the board. Thank you, Daniel Johnson, followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you. Applications from international students being up is no guarantee that those places will be taken up by those students, meaning that there's still some £700 million worth of fees at risk. So there's therefore growing concern that in the absence of additional Scottish Government financial support, higher education institutions will seek to claw back any shortfall in non-tuition-based fees and charges, such as accommodation. So can the, the Minister set out what steps he'll take to make sure that no such additional charges are imposed with the consequent uh, impact on student hardship that that would have? Minister. I uh, thank Daniel Johnson for his question and I expect all institutions in Scotland to be sensitive to the financial situation that uh, prospective students and existing students face uh, at the current time. Uh, I think again he paints, paints a, a very... Uh, an accurate picture in that the Scottish Government, of course, allocated a one-off payment of £75 million for university research early on in this crisis, which was warmly welcomed by the sector, some of whose principals said to me, this is a lot more than the UK Government has done for the sector, and yet we've only got a population of 5.4 million people. But I accept there's more to be done, and I can assure Daniel Johnson we're having intense conversations with the UK Government, because many of the issues around this relate to the Treasury and of other reserved issues, such as uh, ma the main part of research funding, uh, and we are seeking further help for the sectors. We are helping as much as we can within our powers. We do have a welcome package that has been around the UK government yet, so far, but we're waiting for the detail of that and working up how it will be delivered. And I hope that does deliver consequentials to Scotland so we can deliver the help that Daniel Johnson wants us to deliver. Kenneth Gibson, followed by Mark Russell. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Having called on the Scottish Government to cease paying the tuition fees of EU students, I welcome that decision, which I believe should be from this autumn. Can the Minister explain why new EU students starting courses this year will not have to pay tuition fees at all at any time in their course, and would resources thus committed not be better spent on Scottish students? Minister. Well, I could just say to Kenny Gibson that I think, I hope he agrees that the presence of European students in Scotland's campuses has been very much valued over many, many years. 
and one of the strengths of Scotland's incredible reputation for education throughout the world is the internationalism of our campuses and the educational experience you get in this country, which benefits our students, and it's not just a case of others benefiting as well. And that's why we've always been a firm supporter of membership of the European Union and, of course, participating in Erasmus, Erasmus 2020, and meeting our obligations to deliver home fee status for European students studying in this country. But we will stick to our commitment and contract we have with existing EU students who will receive the funding for the remainder of their courses. And of course, last year we announced the transition year of this academic year to continue that, whilst we awaited to see what was happening with them for exit. Mark Ruskell, followed by Liz Smith. Despite the financial crisis at Perth College, the Institute has continued to fill management posts during lockdown, a move which has concerned both lecturers and students about the pressure this now exerts to cut 21 teaching posts. Given the UHI is the only publicly funded higher or further education institute that lacks a collective bargaining agreement for all staff, does the Minister agree that it should develop one urgently in order to meet the government's fair work agenda? Minister. Well, as Mark Ruskell will know, our colleges uh, and universities mm. have got a responsibility to cut their cloth and make sure the books balance and run their institutions uh, with the funds that are made available to them by the Scottish Funding Council uh, and from other sources. And therefore, it's really a matter for Perth College and UHI, uh, that's the, the matter that's highlighted by Mark Ruskell. I'd only say that at this sensitive time, given the pressures that people are facing in their personal lives and with their job security, uh, given the impact of COVID-19, that all our institutions should, of course, be sensitive to the needs of their employees at this time and I'm confident they're doing that and I'll keep reiterating that message and of course we have the fair work agenda as well which I urge time and time again should always be respected by all our colleges and universities. Liz Smith followed by Beatrice Wishart. Uh, thank you. Can I ask the Minister if he agrees with University Scotland's analysis um, which uh, claims that there is now 127.6 million less invested each year into Scottish universities than there was in 2014-15. And that means that every Scottish student at university in uh, this last year is almost 700 less in terms of the government funding. Is that not due to Scottish government policy that these cuts have happened? Minister. Well, uh, I should just say that uh, if Liz Smith is quoting the figures from University of Scotland, she may also want to look down south and look at some of the financial situations facing the colleges and universities in England at the current time. Uh, we've, had 10 years, we've had 10 years of austerity since the Conservative Party took office in 2010. And therefore, yes, we'd have loved to be in the position to allocate even more resources. We've managed to protect the resources very well for our colleges and universities and increase them from time to time. And we'd have loved to have the ability to allocate more resources. But the 10 years of austerity, of course, have not always made that possible. And now we're looking to the UK government to make sure they can help us cope with the COVID-19. And they have a moral obligation also to help us cope with the £211 million cost of Brexit, the Audit Scotland says is just round the corner as we head towards a hard Brexit. Beatrice Wishart, followed by Bob Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Universities Scotland say that digital poverty will reinforce disadvantage. We know about the delays in delivering the R100 programme in the Highlands and Islands. It's well behind schedule. So if online learning is to be a feature of higher and further education, what can be done for those students in rural, remote and island areas with internet speeds that can't cope with online lectures and learning? Minister. Uh, th thank Beatrice Wishart for her question. It's a very important point. It's features throughout all our conversations with the sectors throughout COVID-19 as we've had to have this remarkable shift to online learning. Many institutions, particularly UHI actually, were already there, but others had to shift quite quickly. And that is why we are very conscious that there are many people out there due for financial reasons or other reasons, rurality, that are unable to have the same connectivity as their, their peers. And that's why we did announce today in my statement £5 million to help address these kinds of issues for further and higher education. And that will be targeted towards vulnerable families and some of the people that Beatrice Swishart mentioned in her question. I've also instigated conversations with some of the telecommunication providers to see what we can do to get their support to help provide free access online for learners in Scotland. Thank you, Bob Doris, followed by Sarah Boyack. Presiding officer, following the impact of COVID-19, I know Glasgow, Kelvin College and others are up for the challenge of adapting apprenticeship provision to be flexible 
and responsive, including the possibility of pathway apprenticeships. Can the Scottish Government say more about this vital and ongoing role of colleges in this particular area? And what assurances can the changing landscape apprenticeships uh, can you give that this would impact on the income of FE colleges who rely on income from both foundation and modern apprenticeships at this time? Minister. Um, well, as Bob Doris will know, as we move forward towards economic recovery, uh, the Benny Higgins report and other reports have said that our colleges in particular, uh, right across, obviously, have further higher education as well, but our colleges in particular are going to have a big role in reskilling and upskilling and developing short, sharp courses to help uh, retrain the workforce who may be looking for different employment opportunities and to help businesses cope with the, the post-COVID-19 economy. So our colleges will be at the heart of that, and the Skills Minister, Jamie Hepburn, is taking forward a lot of that work directly with the colleges as we speak. Sarah Boyack, to be followed by Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, how many fully funded places for Scottish students will be delivered from the £19 million predicted to come from EU student fees next year? And can the Cabinet Secretary outline the role of universities in the job guarantee scheme? Minister. Uh, in terms of the job guarantee scheme, we again know that the college and universities are likely to play a role in that, but it's very early days because we've just had these announcements uh, very, very recently. But we are turning our minds with the college and universities to economic recovery and the role they can play, as I just remarked in my previous answer to Bob Doris. Um, and in terms of the number of Scottish places that would be funded by the £19 million that may be available, will be available as a result of not funding EU places, uh, university funding places is quite complex. You can't quickly work out because it depends on how many applications there are, how many uh, the university places the universities decide to create with the money that's allocated to them from the Scottish Government. So we allocate the money, they can decide how to use that across courses and across places. Clearly, as I've said in my opening statement, there will now be £19 million in the system available for Scottish places, and the universities are expected to take that up that offer and hopefully lead to more Scots going to university. And Maureen Watt, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given that a strong and flourishing higher and further education sector is not only vital for those studying at these institutions, but vital to our wider economic recovery from this pandemic, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the Institute of Fiscal Studies report, which finds that 13 universities across the UK may be at risk of insolvency particularly due to the loss of international students. And can you say what risk assessments and contingency planning are being taken in Scottish universities to cope with these pressures? Minister. I uh, thank Maureen Watt for her question. And firstly, I can assure the Parliament that the Scottish Funding Council are working closely with all our colleges and universities at the current time to ensure they survive and get through this. But of course, they'll be carrying out the review that they've been asked to carry out in terms of the future financing of the sector and its sustainability, uh, and we'll wait and see what comes out of that particular uh, debate. Of course, the analysis so far from the Scottish Funding Council has said that the Scottish universities for this academic year face a potential loss of £72 million, and uh, between 384 million and 651 million pounds mm -hmm. thereafter if there is a decline in international students as some people uh, are potentially predicting. We have to wait and see what happens, but we're going to stand by our universities going forward uh, and indeed our colleges uh, as well. Thank you. That concludes questions on the statement, which brings us to decision time. And as there are no questions, we put a result to today's business. That concludes decision time. And I close this meeting.